lay out the thesis because at the beginning of your book you lay out some history and some facts that are pretty compelling about how big and important Asia is these days. And especially now, as you know, we, corporate America is waking up to this fact because growth revenues are declining in China, but they're realizing that, wait, what about the other two and a half, three billion people who live in Asia, from Pakistan through India, so South Asia, plus ASEAN, Southeast Asia, about 10, 12 countries with a population of nearly 3 billion people whose median age is younger than China's, whose growth rates, if you think about India itself, for example, are higher than China's. Younger populations now attracting more foreign investment as well. In fact, India in 2018 beat out China for FDI. ASEAN has received more FDI than China. So I don't want to posit it as either or. There's a lot about China in the book, but finally, there's also a lot about the rest of Asia. Mm -hmm. And it's a collective story. Actually, these economies in many ways mutually reinforce each other as they have since the rise of Japan and then the Tigers and then China. And those same economies that are now wealthy are the leading investors in the developing markets of Asia. So so we have to start to spread our eggs a bit outside of China as well. And one of the points that you make is that if perhaps 19th century largely was about Europe right. and the 20th century was largely about North America and to a significant degree the United States, the 21st century may well be about Asia. At the same time, I want to quote one thing you said, the Asian century begins when Asia crystallizes into a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. That happened, I think it's fair to say, in the United States. Europe, we thought it did. Some people are questioning that now. Right. Is that possible in Asia? When you have something that goes from Russia to Australia, right. from the, the Emirates yeah. all the way over to films, can you have that be a whole? Right. It's a great question. And the way in which we typically look at Asia is through the lens of the European integration process. Therefore, if it does not integrate into a common supranational institution, it is not integration. That's not the only way to look at it. Asia is by far the most diverse region of the world, not only geographically, but also culturally, historically, and so forth. And yet, what we've seen since the end of the Soviet Union, since the end of the Cold War, 30 years ago, is that Asian economies have been rediscovering all of these complementarities in their economies, the industrial centers, financial centers, those with a lot of you know, high labor, a large labor force, been trading more and more with each other. You've got the super cycle effect of the commodities exporters uh, exporting their oil and gas to East Asia and so forth. Now you have the Belt and Road Initiative. So the last 30 years of Asian history that I focus on tells this story of how Asia has been knitting itself back together, recreating or resurrecting these ancient Silk Roads. And I've looked at the last 15 years, 10 years, five years to today, every single combination or pair or vector of Asian countries, all the way from the Persian Gulf to Japan and from Russia to Australia and everything in between, their trade volumes have been rising, cross-border investment flows have been rising, infrastructure rising, and so forth. It's interesting, as I listen to you, every bit of those commonalities have to do with commerce and trade and business. Yes. The United States, people think that the thing that distinguished the United States was actually ideas right. of the founding fathers. It was not yeah. first and foremost commerce. Is this a different kind of commonality that really is commercially based? Because I have a tougher time thinking about the common values, ideas, mm -hmm. uh, government systems right. among those countries. And it's remarkably difficult to find commonalities among such diverse, diffuse civilizations that are so internally, in a way, uh, autarkic, autonomous uh, from each other. And yet I did, actually. There's a whole section of the book about what I call the new Asian values. You and I both remember the last set of Asian values, which was really just a Confucian capitalist inflected way of defending crony capitalism. <laughs> the new Asian values are different. And what I, what I have identified is that, in fact, Asians do have a preference for a technocratic style of government. Even even the democracies, by the way, more Asians live in democracies than the rest of the planet Earth put together, right? In the next six months, Indians, Indonesians, Filipinos, Thais, 1.8 billion people are going to the polls, right? But there's a preference for a uh, you know, strong executive branch with a long-term vision of modernization. Mixed capitalism is another Asian value. A state role in the economy. For us, it's sort of been anathema. Now we kind of realize it's there in the background. But an active role in industrial policy and subsidizing certain sectors and industries. Asians have been doing it all along. It's a European idea, quite frankly, and they do that as well. And then they have very conservative societies socially. So I have identified this set of new Asian values, and you can see it from all the way from the Arab countries to the Confucian societies and in the democracies and non-democracies, there is a preference for these new Asian values. Bring this back to New York, where we're sitting right yeah. now. What does it mean for the United States in our appropriate, smart response to this? I mean, one of 
things you suggest is perhaps when we took over from the Europeans, we may not have moved fast enough. It may have made, might have made World War I worse. And yet we have like Graham Allison, whom you also refer to, right. with the Thucydides trap. Right. Uh, how could we facilitate this to both our benefit as well as the Asian countries? It's a great question. And let's go back to the name of your program, Balance of Power, which for a geopolitical nerd like me is the greatest name for a show. Um, the other, the, the twin concept there is grand strategy, right? And what you're asking is what is America's grand strategy towards Asia? And Asia, for most of its 4,000 years of history, has been multipolar. There has not been one dominant authority or empire that's managed to subdue all of Asia for any lasting period of time since the Mongols more than 700 years ago. And I strongly believe, and this is the message of the book, that that will not repeat itself even with all the power that China has. And in fact, what we see happening is that with Belt and Road, you even have a rapid backlash against it. You have countries saying, sure, we want the infrastructure, but we don't want to be heavily indebted. We don't want to be a new, we don't want to be colonies. We want to use this infrastructure to modernize, to grow, to diversify our economies, to get a sovereign uh, debt rating, to attract more foreign investment, and then they will dilute China's influence in their country. So what should our grand strategy be? A multipolar Asia, diverse centers of growth, and those are the markets that we want to be selling into. And we can make that happen if we join the TPP agreement, if we participate together with Europeans in aggressively um, competing with China for infrastructure finance, but even doing some of it with them and alongside them, and that's going to mean more growth markets for all of us. What could we do to overcome what has historically been a challenge to the United States, which is actually to learn about foreign cultures and foreign <laughs> countries? It's not about our strength. Now, in fairness to us, we have a large enough economy where we have oceans on both sides. Yes. So we haven't had to. Yeah. It hasn't been like the Netherlands. It hasn't been like England. Right. But I certainly, I know the Japanese sent a lot of scholars here to learn the United yep. States. Chinese now yep. have a lot of people in the United States learning. Yep. What could we do so that we actually understand the situation before we even decide on our grand strategy? There are some surprising underlying demographic data here that I go into in the book. And, and I, I'll admit it's a bit, bit autobiographical as well because I'm an Asian American who grew up here. And now I've become what I call an American Asian. I've sort of repatriated back to Asia. I live in Singapore. I've been there for a few years. And I'm not alone, otherwise I wouldn't have written about it. I'm talking about millions of young Americans, older Americans, who are you know, migrating overseas and looking for opportunities in Asia. It starts with study abroad, it goes through university life, young professionals, entrepreneurs. People are flocking to Asia and they're settling there in the established financial centers and now in some of the second tier cities that are coming up. It's an exciting place to be. So travel, education. Let's remember, it's something very interesting. Younger, those that are younger than us, you know, half our age, the students of today, they're already growing up learning Chinese. You know, it's not such a big yeah. deal for them the way it is for older people. So there is an adaptation to the Asian centrality of the mm -hmm. future that is actually not so hard to digest.